Okay, uh, good morning, buenos dias, and uh, thank you, uh, everyone who was involved. It's a long list, Gabriela, Leandro, I don't know, uh, Andres, who, who actually contacted me, whoever was foolish enough to invite me here. Uh, I, uh, it's it's great that you can actually put up a conference like this with, with this, this many attendees and everything, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so now, I'm not actually going to be talking about small talk if, if we want to be strict about it. I'm going to be talking about Newspeak. And Newspeak is uh, it's a language that is uh, logically sort of a descendant of small talk, so it, I hope it won't be too unfamiliar. And uh, there's probably a few of you who have heard all this once or twice before, and uh, you'll just have to sit there and be, yes, well, exactly. If you watch Elliot, you should see he's, he's taped his mouth shut. Uh, so uh, what is Newspeak? Newspeak is a dynamic class-based language, and that, you should be saying, hmm, that's familiar. Where have I encountered such a thing before? Uh, and so, up to, up to that point, of course, there are, there are lots of, uh, of languages like that, uh, including at least one really good one. And I'd argue there are now at least two really good ones. So, uh, what makes Newspeak different from Smalltalk is that uh, are these two properties here, right? Uh, and these two properties do not hold in, in most languages. In fact, they're both rather unusual, and it's not easy to find languages with, with either of these. And the combination really turns out to be interesting and turns out to be a very good fit with the sort of object-oriented way and, and, and uh, small talky way of thinking. It's basically uh, taking small talk further along those same lines in order to, to address what I perceive to be certain problems with small talk. So uh, if I complain about small talk and point to its deficiencies, just to your, you're in need of tough love. So um, what are our goals here? Our, uh, you know, our goals are to become rich and famous. But um, <laughs> since it's not polite to say that, we'll, we'll put some technical goals instead. Uh, so uh, there's a list of properties here. And uh, one of them is a property you know very well, which is the third one, reflectivity. Right, which is uh, the proper way of saying dynamic languages. Right, dynamic language is a rather unfortunate term that that has gotten that we're sort of stuck with. Right, because dynamic language means the language changes over time. Well, uh, the only languages that don't are dead languages, generally speaking. You know, uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics are very stable these days uh, because they don't have many users. Uh, Small talk has been very stable, regardless of how many users, but partly if you get it right the first time, you don't need to fix it up as much over time. Uh, if you, if you, most languages need to evolve a lot, and they never get there. Uh, but this property, basically, of, of the, the key property here is this ability to, to, what's dynamic is not the language so much as the programs you write in the language, right? It is the programs themselves that can evolve while they're running. That is the, the defining property of what people perceive to be a dynamic language. And that's certainly a property we want to preserve because that's, that's uh, you know, there are different languages that have these properties nowadays, some rather, unfortunately, rather popular. Uh, but uh, if it's done right, it looks a lot like small talk. Uh, on the other hand, there's, there's this list of other properties which, frankly, small talk is not very strong on and might account for the fact that there aren't uh, the, you know, the 5,000 people I would expect at a small talk event. Right, uh, and chief among these, uh, the, you know, and the one that Newspeak in particular has made its its main contribution to is modularity, as we'll see. Right, and uh, I don't know what you think, but generally modularity in programming languages is a difficult topic, and mo there aren't very many languages that have anything even remotely decent. Uh, Smalltalk in particular doesn't really try. I mean, a lot of languages have constructs for modularity, you know, packages and various modules, all kinds of things. Uh, they usually don't work very well, but they do something. Uh, Smalltalk basically doesn't really try to address this at all, uh, which is okay, but it really does need to be addressed, and it's a problem. And if you go outside this community and try... Uh, recently, I don't know how many of you follow the ESOG mailing list, but there was this, uh, this thread. Uh, someone had gone to the Google Summer of Code, and, you know, he posted his experience where he had a hard time communicating how great Smalltalk was and everything to, to uh, the other people at the, at the meeting, which is probably an experience many of you have. And uh, this, this led to this sort of um, 
a self-flagellation kind of thing where everybody you know, felt guilty and explained, yeah, we should do more, we should interoperate more, blah, blah, blah. Of course, nothing will come of this discussion, I assure you. And, and in order that something discuss, actually things really need to change and nothing hurts people more than change and they don't change and this applies to the rest of the world, which is why they don't use small talk and it applies to you, which is why you use small talk unchanged and, and, and refuse to evolve with the times. So I'm here to give you a hard time and, and try to convince you to move on. So modularity is one thing, security is another. We live in a world of, of cyber crime and increasingly cyber warfare. And, uh, you know, if you don't, security is one of those things that you have to think about early because uh, patching it later doesn't work. And uh, again, Smalltalk was designed with this beautiful vision of education and openness and making everything accessible uh, back. And it's very easy to think this way in the green hills overlooking Palo Alto. It's a beautiful place, I know. Uh, but uh, they weren't thinking of the Russian mafia or, or the North Korean secret police or any of those things uh, back in, the, you know, Alan had a great vision, but this is one of the points which you will be hard-pressed to find in his early writings. And unfortunately, the world isn't, you know, as, as nice as it should be, and security is a real problem and getting more so. And small talk is, is, is sort of, by design, anti-secure. So, so something has to be done about that. And then there's interoperability, right? Uh, basically playing nice with the rest of the world. And again, there's really, this is a distasteful matter, uh, right? The rest of the world is kind of, you know, primitive and ugly. I mean, compared to small talk. And why would you really want to interoperate with them? You'll just get your hands dirty. Nevertheless, uh, there, is, there is a need because that's what's out there. There is the force of, of the large majority of, of, of computer users and systems and so forth. And you need to do a better, we need, whoever, whoever wants to, to succeed needs to do a better job of interoperating. So these are things we're trying to do while preserving what's really great about small talk, which is no, no small thing, obviously. It's, it's hard to do such things, it's easy to ruin them. And uh, by the end of this talk, hopefully you can judge whether I've ruined anything or not. So let's go, go get back to, to these ideas about Newspeak. Uh, this property that all names are late bound. Uh, this is something I sometimes call message-based programming. And I, I have a few select quotes from Alan Kay that serve my purpose. I love quotes because you can always selectively edit and distort meaning. And, and, uh, so uh, basically, uh, Alan has said repeatedly that you know, small talk is not the be-all and end-all of, of what, it, what he was after. And in particular, uh, he had this notion of, of, being, of emphasizing messages more as opposed to objects because... Uh, that's important, and I think that that's true. So, uh, what uh, the interpretation I've put on it uh, to make these things rather concrete, because if you've ever listened to Alan or met Alan, uh, he's always 30 years out there, and it's a great vision, but someone has to bring it down a little back to sort of into Earth orbit. And so, uh, concretely, what, what, what does this really mean? It means that everything's a message sent. Every operation at runtime is a message send, in the small talk sense. At least one good thing about this audience, I don't have to explain what message send really means. <laughs> so, uh, why isn't this true in, oops, okay. why isn't this true in small talk? Uh, if we take uh, a piece of code like this, I mean, right, it's all message sends to objects, blah, 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 you know all that. Well, uh, all the stuff that is in red, projectors never do red very well, I should learn. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, the, the stuff, well, in, it's, it's written in blood, except now the blood's a little dry. And uh, if you look at this, well, what do we have? We have an assignment, actually. Now we have an assignment. And uh, that's not a message sent. We have an uh, array, which uh, you happen to know that it's global. You couldn't really tell from the language. It might be a class variable, but what, whatever it is, it certainly isn't a message sent. You've got n, which again, you can't really in this isolated fragment tell what it is, but it isn't a message sent, right? It could be a little temporary, it could be an argument, it could be a, an instance variable. Uh, same with t. And uh, return, actually, new colon, obviously, is a message sent, and return, you can squint and argue that it's a message sent back to the calling context. Which, uh, we, we aim to make that real, by the way. 
Uh, so if we decided we really were serious about message passing, what would it look like? Well, it would look like this. Uh, and that's assuming that indeed the T and N were instance variables so we could actually make this make sense. And again, all the stuff that's in red is now uh, painfully obvious stuff that you don't didn't want to write, right? It's a lot of extra stuff in here. And extra stuff, if it doesn't actually convey meaning, if it, if it doesn't do something interesting, is, is something to be avoided. So uh, one trick you can do is borrow an idea from self, uh, this idea of implicit receivers. So you don't actually have to write the receiver explicitly. Most of this stuff goes away if you do that, right? Uh, except for these extra parentheses, everything has gone away. That's nice. Uh, but uh, you know, that's, it's not as simple as you think, right? You're thinking that, that we've just made self implicit. Uh, actually, as you'll see, because of class nesting and stuff, it's, it's, it's a little trickier to decide who the implicit receiver is, but most of the time, the, the programmer doesn't have to think about it. It's essentially right like lexical scope. Uh, most of you have had, no doubt, the misfortune of learning Java, uh, and uh, you know how that works, right? You basically mention a name, and it's in the surrounding scope, and you don't really think most of the time which object is associated with it. But it's very important that, that the system know which object is associated with it because everything is going to be a message sent to some object. Uh, one further tweak, which is not deep or anything, but I'm showing it to you because you'll probably see it in the examples later on, uh, is this, uh, this double colon notation, which is just basically to get the syntax a little lighter, right? So we don't need the parentheses. It's just like, uh, it, it acts sort of like an assignment except it's a message sent. So it's like T colon except that uh, its precedence is lower, so you don't need to wrap parentheses around uh, the expression. And uh, it has the property that it will return the expression that was passed in, uh, regardless of what t colon does. Okay? And that, uh, that turns out to be handy. And depending, I think this works in the development version, but doesn't work in the actual public release yet. I have a question. Yeah. Sorry. But why didn't you use... And the assignment instead of double zero. Because everybody knows what the assignment means. And everybody thinks that the assignment is an assignment. And reprogramming that is just, you know, so, hard. We okay, very, so very that, deliberately... That only for the uh, precedent. Yeah. And you can use it anywhere. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, you, you will... Mm, okay. Don't test the implementation too hard on that right now. <laughs> <laughs> But you use it a lot simply because of the precedence and usually as an assignment, uh, okay. where you'd use an assignment. So again, uh, if you compare this to this, uh, we, we seem to have made some syntactic progress on making it easier to use message sense. But that's, that's not very deep and not very important. It's just to, to get you a little more familiar with the notation. Uh, so let's look again at small talk and see, examine some of these things that, that weren't message sense and see exactly what happened to them, right? So we have instance variables, right? Uh, now we don't have, we still have instance variables. We call them slots following self, but you can never access them directly, right? If let's go back to this, right? If when you when you when you talk about t and you in an instance variable t and you speak, you're always going to an it's always a message sent. You're basically calling an accessor. The accessors are automatically defined. You don't have to go to the browser and ask it to define accessors for you like in Squeak. It's just part of the language. So t and t colon are are automatically defined. Right, so that makes it simple, and that's not a big deal, but it has some nice properties that are worth mentioning. Uh, one is that no code depends on, your repre on the representation of your object anymore. Now, in Smalltalk, you're used to that, right? No client code depends on your object, but your class does and your subclasses do, and that's not true anymore. No code, no code even in the, in the class itself. There is no line of code you can point to that cares what your representation is, except to the where you define it, right? You define that there's a slot T, and that tells you what the representation of that object is, that it has such a slot. But nothing cares about that. It's, it's, it, you can change that everywhere as long as you preserve that interface. You can get rid of this method, of this, of this slot, as long as you replace it with suitable methods that preserve that, uh, you know, the protocol of that object. Right, so that's a nice property to have, a, a good software engineering property. Uh, again, we're, we're warming up because these are the fairly small and minor things. And they're also the things that are easier to explain. So, it's good to know that. Again, this, this is a property that self had, and it's, it's nice, but it probably doesn't carry enough work to go and, you know, wait to change the language. 
Uh, but let's talk about uh, a little bit, uh, we'll return to this late bound name business, but let's talk a little about, about this idea of no global namespace. But because this is the one that is really hard for people to, we're so habituated to this. I mean, any real programming language you've ever used had a global namespace. Uh, interesting, Lambda Calculus doesn't. People don't notice that until you really think about it. They're, people who really, really think about what they're doing, uh, they get different results. So anyway, what happens without a global namespace? Let's look at the small talk example again. Well, we have this array. Well, what, if we're getting rid of it, what's going to happen? How, how is this going to work? Uh, well, generally, we, we won't have a global. I'll show you in a little while what, how, how we actually make pro real programs work, because that's probably what, what is bothering you right now. If you're, if you're, well, what's bothering you is you're locked in a room and I'm talking. But uh, <laughs> what, if you're thinking, the, the, the three of you in the audience that are thinking about what I said are wondering how does this actually work. Uh, so, uh, Newspeak doesn't have globals. It doesn't have class variables or pool variables. If uh, those of you who are realize that Smalltalk has these useless things. Uh, it doesn't have class instance variables. Now, there is nothing that, that can qualify a static state. And that's, that in itself is a good thing. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I don't want classes, I don't want top level classes to have state. I want classes to be purely pieces of program. I want them to be values. Yes, but uh, object has uh, instance variables and classes are objects. So, why? so oh, yeah, so it doesn't, one does not follow from the other, right? Not all objects have to have an instance variable, right? They are objects, but they don't have instance variables. And that's precisely so that they, I can ensure that they're always stateless, which is an important property. But couldn't you have immutable classes? I mean, having classes with, I mean, with instance variable, but... Uh, yeah, so, so... Uh, uh, in, in an hour's talk, I'm not going to get into probably, well, I might show you immutable, uh, okay. there, there is our immutable, but, but for classes, <coughs> haven't found, uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to keep them completely, you know, we, we don't want initialize, even for immutables, right, they get initialized. You don't want to, you want to be able to, to have them completely side effect free, so they load and unload smoothly. I mean, Java had this problem. I, I could spend an hour here t telling nasty stories about Java, but it's not that interesting. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that, well, you know some of them, but I, 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 I was at the, I was at the crime scene. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, specifically, that's something you want to avoid. That specific issue about classes getting initialized when they get loaded, and then you can't transparently load and unload them. Uh, you know, it, you have to be really, really careful. It is so easy to step into something you didn't intend to. Uh, so, why, no, I'm not going to go into all the reasons why static state is a bad idea. Uh, but there's lots and lots of, of reasons why it would be good to avoid it. Uh, we'll talk maybe later a little bit about them. But, it, but that, was, that was a goal. Now, you're going to ask, so where does the state go, right? Uh, the whole point is, that of course, it goes in objects. But that, that begs the question because uh, we, we knew that already. But this is about state that is shared among many objects. Right? If it lives in one object and only one object is accessing it, it, it's easy, it's an instance variable. But now I need to share the state among multiple objects. Where is it going to go? And, uh, and, and it has to be reasonably convenient. So, of course, the answer goes back 50 years or so. In fact, all the answers go back 52 years. Um, but... Uh, you know, shared lexical scope has been around for a long time, and the precise variation is something that uh, the beta folks... Uh, how many people here have even heard of beta? Yeah, that's about what I expected. Uh, sad. So, so beta is a lovely language developed in Scandinavia in the 70s and 80s. Uh, that is, again, uh, like, like most really elegant, lovely things, doesn't seem to get a whole lot of uh, commercial traction, right? But it is it is something, if you're interested in programming languages, it is worth knowing because it had some, some really cool ideas and was done very, very elegantly. Uh, in particular, they more or less invented the notion of nested classes, and unlike nested classes, which you might be familiar from in Java, they actually knew what they were doing. Uh, again, the, the, the people who, who introduced, I know for a fact that the people who wanted nested classes in Java and introduced it were motivated by beta. They wanted to capture that. They didn't, because they didn't understand beta very deeply. That's, that's simply a fact. 
And it's very important. Again, the subtleties of how you define these things matter. If you define it, if you get a little off, it's like shooting at someone. You either hit or you miss. It's not like, oh, I almost, you know. So, um, the nested class mechanism actually is, an, if it's done right, is a very good way of modeling the world. A lot of things have this hierarchical structure and you can nest them. And it turns out to be a natural modularity solution as well. So this will be key to how, how we do modularity. So again, the, one of the big differences between you speak and small dog is classes nest. Uh, which, you know, brings us to our goal of modularity. And uh, so, again, what's, what's unusual, we don't have packages. We don't have, you know, any of these umpteen constructs you've probably seen in some language course or another about how to, to organize your programs. The only thing we use are classes and, and class nesting. And that's, that's, that's what's unusual, and, and it's, a, it's actually an obvious idea that many people who have encountered any form of nested classes have thought about. Uh, it hasn't been really done successfully before because, it's again, it's very tricky to get it just right. I mean, it's, it, it's fairly easy once you do, but it's very easy to botch it. So at this point, I think I want to show you real programs. And center this. Uh, so what you've got here is uh, VMware. And I doubt if you can see this. So, so this microphone is a nuisance. Oh, I just sh shut it up. Hang on. So this room is small enough that you'll be able to hear me because I can't both navigate this and you know uh, I should have you know my I should have been an octopus. Uh, no, I don't need a chair. I just need to to have that device on the way. Yeah, I need both hands exactly because otherwise, well, it's fine except you won't be able to see this. You see. So what we've got here is um, is the Newspeak programming environment. It's called Hopscotch. Uh, several things are called hopscotch, really. Oops, the self-destruct button. And uh, and this is this is a, a essentially a, a browser of sorts, but it's different. You know, it's a it's it's all written in Newspeak. And we're going to look at what are we going to look? We're going to look at this guy for starters. This class, can you any more? Can you read that? Well, we'll we'll make it bigger in a minute. Oh, we can't do both, uh, probably. Hang on. Yeah. Okay. So this, this thing is, uh, is a view of a class called combinatorial parsing. And uh, combinatorial parsing is a top-level class. Uh, so in Smalltalk, you only have top-level classes, right? But the idea here is that classes nest. So you will be building, uh, essentially, a whole libraries as classes with nested classes in them. The whole, the whole, uh, say, a framework or library that would usually be, you'd put in a category and have a whole bunch of classes, you actually declare a top-level class and you nest all the, all, the, all the pieces that are going to be part of that thing in one class, which in itself, it gives you a, a nice kind of structuring device. And uh, this one in particular represents a parser combinator library. And I'm going to, to go out on a limb and bet that there are probably as many people here who know what a parser combinator library is as knew, who knew what beta was. Uh, but basically, it's a way of doing parsing. Uh, it is to the things you might have heard of, like Yak and Antler, as Smalltalk is to C and C++. You know, you get... It's a nice way of doing parsing. And you don't really need to understand any of that, except it makes a, it, it's, it makes a simple example here to show a few key points about Newspeak. So one of them is, yeah, the whole library is contained in this, in, this, in this one enclosing class. And we're going to look here at one of the nested classes. This one is called combinatorial parser. It's actually the root of the, of the framework, right? It's the class that almost all the other classes you see here. All these other things are they're all classes, right? Bunch of classes that serve the framework. And hopefully this is big enough that you can kind of see, right? And uh, we'll look at this one, which is the root. And we'll look in particular at a method which the only thing that I want you to look at is this. Right? Because it doesn't really matter what this thing does for, for, the, for our purposes here. What does matter is that we're using this name ordered collection, which is what you think it is. Except that now you should ask, well, where did it come from? Because there is no global namespace. 
right? It isn't being looked up in small talk or anything. So where, where on earth does this originate? And uh, so, uh, if we go back to the enclosing scope, we can see that it originates right here. So we're going to change the view so you can get a better sense of what it looks like. And maybe make it even bigger. So ordered collection is, is actually a slot. The slots, the instance variables, they're defined between vertical bars just like, uh, like temporaries are. And that'll probably change because we're going to try to try and tweak the syntax a little bit to market it better to, to ignorant people who don't know small talk. And, uh, but anyway, it's, it's essentially an instance variable of the surrounding class. And as I explained, that generates an accessor method. So what happened over here, we can actually view them together. What happened over here was, we're this is a send with an implicit receiver, right? But it's a send to the, uh, to, 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 uh, the accessor. It's invoking the accessor for that variable. And, and notice this isn't a self-send, right? Because this object, if we can, uh, I don't know if we can get it to move. Yeah, we can get it to move. This guy, combinatorial parsing, parser, right, is nested inside something else, right? So it isn't the instance of combinatorial parser that has a slot named order collection. It's the instance of the enclosing class. But ultimately, most of the time, you don't have to think about this very hard because it's just the lexical scope. You can see it. It's defined in, in the surrounding piece of text, right? And that works fine. The only person who has to think about it is the poor soul who implements this. And... Uh, well, we thought about it together, and it, it, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit tricky to implement, but after that, you're fine. Yeah? Yeah. If it is a message sent when you are debugging, yeah. do you s really debug it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can follow the... Okay, so it'll show you a piece of crap at the moment. It'll show you the, the actual body of, of, the, of the accessor, which it really shouldn't. Right, it would be nicer just to tell you that it, to hide that, but that's uh, yeah, fine tuning of the. Somebody didn't finish the job. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Are those slots stay in the classes? Those slots, what about? Are they stays in the classes? Order collection, whatever. They are not in the class. They are in the object, in an instance of this class. They're instance variables. They're exactly instance variables. No, they are object instance variables. They are exactly instance variables. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you don't have to worry about how this is implemented, but I do worry. Because uh -huh. I want to inspect everything. Uh, so as a programmer... As a programmer... access to this tricky implementation? Uh, as a, well, okay, so, so if... Uh, I have a doubt that we're going to get to 10.30 and explain all this because uh, this, you're a... You're a Resistive audience, you you are you ask questions and stuff, but uh, but uh, of course a a you can. There is uh, the idea is that it depends who you are, right? Because w one of the ideas here is to control access to the meta level more carefully than in in, in small talk, and uh, I hope we'll get to that. Uh, so yes, you can see it, but as a rule, you declared a slot and you have access to it. And what you should see when you de de ideally, I think, what you should see when you debug this is not the implementation you should see the slot definition. You know, it should say, oops, we're in this, you know, it should take you to the slot definition, and you know it, it was an accessor for a slot, as opposed to an a method of the same name, which you could do, right? One of the interesting things here, you can override slot accessors with regular methods, you can over, you know, there's all kinds of interesting combinations that can happen here, right? But the idea here basically is uh, that it's an instance variable of the surrounding class, okay? So that explains how, how we got it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. which, which method is well, well, you, well, yeah, right. Uh, so this is actually what I am about to explain. If, <laughs> so if, if I ever get there. Right, so no, it's a good question. And uh, okay, so we need to move this a bit because we want to see a bit. Hang on. We want to get this to, where's the scroll bar? We want to get this so we can see everything. And then we want to... Expand that. Okay. So, step, we're going to take this in stages, right? First step was where did it come from, where it was referenced? Well, that was an accessor method, okay? So, it's an accessor method for this slot, right? So, as you can see, the slot is being initialized. 
And this is not exactly an assignment. This is a slot declaration. It's not really an expression. It's, it's, where it, it's declaring that slot. It's just like where you declare an instance variable, except that, yeah, there are initializers, unlike in, in Smalltalk, right? So what does this really mean? Well, this slot, first of all, one detail, someone asked about immutable stuff, right? So it says equal, we actually mean equal. Uh, this is going to be an immutable slot. And what that means is that we're just going to generate a getter method for it. And there is no way that you, at the, without going to the meta level, can ever access the slot and do anything with it except read what's in it. But, but okay? you, you, maybe you want to have an object that is mutable, but mm -hmm. you don't want somebody from outside to change it. How do you deal with that? Patience. <laughs> okay. While I'm here, before I forget, you know, you could change this uh, to uh, this, and it's deliberately two colons, not one, so it still isn't quite an assignment, but this is how you would declare it mutable. And then there would be a, an accessor, which just tells you nothing about what someone outside can or cannot do. Okay? But it means that the slot will have a setter method. Okay? So we don't really want that. Hello? Uh, I think this, well, we have to unzoom because things, oh, okay, that's all it was. Yeah. Uh, right, so we're, we're doing very badly on time. Um, so anyway, it's being assigned. So what is happening here? Something called platform is being sent to met method message collections, which is being sent to message ordered collection. Uh, what the, the intent here is, there is this object platform that presumably represents the platform, the basic library, something. We'll, we'll get to what it, what it might actually be. You send it the collections method, and you get a collections module, an object representing the collections library, because we do whole libraries as, as single objects because of the nesting. So there would be, there would be a, a definition of the collections library that has all the you know, ordered collection, collection, dictionary, all those guys nested within it. In fact, there is such a thing. Uh, and then you'd send it the ordered collection me message, and that would give you the ordered collection class object. And then we'd store it in this slot. Right? And then we would have ordered the ordered collection we actually want to work with and create to create ordered collections. We'd have that class object available to us because this is in scope. Right? And this is the accessor. And still, we're still begging the question. So, okay, that's all fine, but where did platform come from? So, platform came up from over here. And what, what is this? Uh, this sequence of code here, from here to here, and this will change to curly braces, I'm afraid, because it is terribly important. You know, curly braces, they run faster. Uh, but uh, this is the instance initializer. This, get, this gets executed when you, when you instantiate an, uh, a class, right? So this is the class. In fact, in the, in the text format, it, it will say, the browser doesn't show it, but it will say it will have the keyword class, so people are comfortable right in front of it, like, like a proper programming language, quote-unquote. And uh, we're declaring it, a combinatorial parsing, and we put this uh, message pattern up here, this method signature, if you will. Right? And that method signature tells us that there's going to be a factory method for the class that is actually the one that, that really does the instantiation. Right? So when you call, when you have combinatorial parsing, you, when you have a, this class object in your hand, you call using lib colon, you pass it some, some object, which will be the, the platform parameter. This will cause an allo object to be allocated and will cause this to run with platform in scope. Okay? So now we've sort of, we've kind of pushed the question pretty far out, though we haven't really gotten to the bottom of this matter. But essentially, everything comes in through this factory method, right? And so this is where we got our access to the universe. And this is how we got ordered collection and, for example, error. And uh, there's several things that I wanted to note about this that are actually fairly important to, to this notion of modularity. One is, platform is in scope exactly here. It isn't in scope in the rest of the, of the class body, right? It's only in the initializer. So anything that you want from the outside world, you're going to have to extract from the parameters. It doesn't have to be platform, of course. It could be any, you can put any message pattern with any parameters you want. It's quite common for a lot of things to, to get the platform object. Whatever it is, you have to extract it here because it isn't going to be around. There is nothing like a Java fully qualified name that you can use elsewhere. So you are going to have to use this idiom to get the pieces you want. Everything that this, this, the code in this module relies on is going to be listed here. 
And there's no special construct, right? There's no import construct, there's nothing. We're just doing instance variable initialization, but we're using this mechanism in such a way that all the external dependencies of this code are written nicely here, and you can look at them. This is a bit different from Smalltalk. This is actually a very weak point in Smalltalk, I'm sorry to say. Right? So you get basically all your imports as you were right here. You can see them at a glance. That's one interesting point to make. Uh, another point to make is, of course, that this is just a regular class and I can instantiate it multiple times. So I can have as many of the configurations of this library as I want. I can give it different platform objects that might return different collections libraries that might have, say, different properties, like some collections, uh, they trade space, time, whatever. Uh, I can choose different implementations. Right? And I can have that, and, and in, say, the Java world, this is a huge deal because it's called side-by-side -side deployment, and there is this monstrous thing called OSGI, and it is, it's very lightweight. It only had, someone gave a talk and said it only had 28 kinds of APIs. Okay? So it's, it's really, really lightweight stuff. And it attempts to do this in, in, in the Java world, to let you basically have multiple configurations of an entire library existing simultaneously in one program. So you can do that. Another thing you can do, of course, because there's, this is, everything's going through this protocol. It's an object. You send it messages. If I create a different implementation of a parsing library that obeys this protocol, it's just like any other class that I had different implementations with, uh, you know, that obeyed a protocol, right? I can program over that polymorphically. I can have different implementations of the library. I can have them all interacting at once. All the nice properties you get from a single object, we sort of lifted that to the library level. And that, that's, that's a big part of, of, the, of the Newspeak story. Uh, what else do I want to tell you about this? Uh, as long as these parameters don't have interactions between them, right? If you don't send the same parameter or, or something stateful, right? Then the code here is reentrant, right? Because all the state is in these instance variables. These are instance variables of an instance of combinatorial parsing, right? It's, as someone asked whether they were class, inst they're class instance variables, no, they are not. They are just every every instance of cl uh, that you create of this will have its own copy of these guys, right? It's just straight instance variables. So there's reentrancy. And what else did I want to tell you? Ah, yes. This is the only way to talk to the outside world, right? This is the only way. There there is no. There are a few things like string and stuff. You know, basic types that are inherited from object, but these are again completely stateless. You know, things, any, the only way you can get at the outside world and do anything to it, including anything malicious, anything bad to it, is by accessing things that you got that were given to you through these parameters. These are, this is different from an import statement in a classical language, right? An import statement says, I want this and I'm going to name it and it's, go it's going to get it. This is, I'm going to try and get this from whatever parameter you give me. It is entirely up to the calling context to decide what this thing has. So essentially, every instance of this, of a top-level class which acts as a module, is sandboxed by definition. Okay? The parameters here are what defines a sandbox, okay? and which is going to be key to our security model. So again, it's, it's, it's going to be very, in that respect, it's going to be really different from Smalltalk. Because one of the, the basic weaknesses in Smalltalk revolves around this issue of modularity, that it's really hard to tell who's connected to whom and who's touching whom without right, going through the code. And here you have very, very tight control over, over what's happening with these things. So we're going we're gonna to leave this for a little while and go back to our regularly scheduled program. And if you prefer me not yelling at you, I'll, I'll even use this. So, uh, you get some idea of why Newspeak is, is rather different and, and uh, has, a, has a very pretty powerful modular structure. Uh, a few points I, I didn't uh, harp on enough. Uh, just as we can't refer to variables directly, we can't refer to classes directly. Right? We're always using accessors. Each one of those nested classes you saw essentially implicitly defines an accessor method. When I speak about a class, I am speaking, I am actually calling its accessor method. Of course, this implies that classes are first class objects, and, and you sort of knew that. But it also implies that classes are virtual, right? They can be overridden just like methods can. So you can define this library, and then you can subclass it and override some of the classes in it. 
And you can override it with a method that, say, generates the class dynamically or goes to the network and finds it or whatever. Or you can override it with another class declaration. Or you can override it with a slot that stores a class declaration from somewhere. And nobody really cares because they can't tell the difference. Right? The program is, is it's just sending a message. Uh, one of the nice sort of things that fall out of that is you get mix-ins for free. Everybody know what a mix-in is? Who knows what a mix-in is? Some sort of discrepancy here. Um, so a mix-in is the part of a class without its, its superclass, right? It's the definition of the class. It tells you what the class is adding to the superclass chain, right? It's per... Or, or also the Everything, yeah. It's literally, if you take a Java program, which has syntax, which makes it a little easier to, to talk about, right? It's the stuff after the extends, the, between the curly braces. It's all the things that the class is adding, whatever methods, instance variables, anything that it is adding, independent of what superclass chain it's in, right? And it's nice to be able to, to factor that out, because then you can, you can overcome limitations of a single inheritance. You can plug things into different <coughs> chains. Right? So this is an old thing. I published a paper about this 20 years ago. Uh, you're encouraged to go look at it. But uh, the point is that we get this for free. Why do we get it for free? Because when you write a class declaration and you mention the name of a superclass, that's not a class either. That's just a method call, just like everything else. Everything is a method call. Therefore, essentially, it's all late bound. Right? We cannot actually compile this into a fixed class chain because we don't know what the superclass is really going to be. These classes get created on demand when you access them the first time. When you go to such a class, you call it super... It, it, to define the class, it looks, what's my superclass? Well, now I'll send this message and get my superclass at that point. Right? And so only then will it be, be created. And in different contexts, that superclass could be something different. For example, if I take the code I had earlier... Uh, do we want to do this? Okay, we'll just show it to you. <coughs> if we look at this, right? Let's look. So we said here combinatorial parser was uh, the root of the class hierarchy. Let's look at say alternating parser. Indeed, it's a subclass of combinatorial parser. If I create two different instances of the the surrounding module. I am going to create different nested classes for each of these. Because, for example, I could override combinatorial parser, and then what will happen is that all the classes that, that, are, that uh, are subclasses of it will, will inherit from this new one, from the overridden one. It all, it's all self-referential. It's all bound just like method calls are. If you override a method, your other methods call the overridden one. If you override a class, classes that refer to it get the overridden one. So if you, in particular, subclasses of a class that's been overridden get, you know, their superclass will be the overridden one, right? Which means that you change the top of a class hierarchy only. Say you decide that this hierarchy needs to have a name in its combinatorial parsing class, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in this guy, in combinatorial parser. You, add, you subclass it, you add combinatorial parser, and now everybody has, has inherited that. You've changed the whole framework, right? That's class hierarchy inheritance. Uh, sure. Well, basically, it is the, it actually that's how it's implemented, right? That's that's the, how you guarantee that it works, right? Is it all goes through the same mechanism? Otherwise, you're going to screw it up. Uh, well, no, no, no! Don't do that. Ah. Okay. Well, we may not do the rest of the demo because uh, it takes VMware forever to do these things and come back and whatever. We'll see. Uh, Anyway, so th these are kind of nice properties, and they let us do class hierarchy inheritance. So, for example, uh, there are different ways to implement uh, uh, such a parser combinator library. There's uh, pack rat parsing. There's various mechanisms. Again, they basically trade space for time, or there are clever algorithms. We can implement several versions of this library. One of the things we've done was we actually have created a subclass of it, uh, you know, for various reasons, and we overrode. Uh, the top level class in there and it all works, right? You get the entire framework changed just by saying, I want the same thing except for the, soup, the top level class to be like this. So that's all kind of neat. And uh, 
Where are we along our goals? Well, modularity is the big thing. We'll see how far we get. Let's talk about security for a moment. Um, so I'm basically explaining this, but I'm going to hammer on it a bit more. Right? Objects as capabilities. There is a thing called the object capability model. Mark Miller, who's now at Google, did a lovely piece of work on, on uh, a lot of good work, but in particular there was a language called E, capital E, uh, that was a language designed for security. And uh, he's sort of given up now, and he, he's trying to bring all this to the JavaScript world. So, you know, it's, it happens to people. They, they uh, go on and try and make the ugly world better by taking ideas from, you know, they know better, but they know that they won't have an impact unless they sell out. I'm not saying that Mark sold out, but I certainly sold out. Uh, so anyway, the idea here, the important thing is, this is an idea that fits very well with, 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 with the concepts you're familiar with. That um, it's, it's having an object in your hand that gives you the power to change something, to, to do, in particular to do damage, and you use that to control security. It's the difference between, if you, if you have a party, you invite people to the party, and you don't want gate crashers, you don't want random people to come to your party. You can do one of two things. You, uh, you can check at the gate and ask them to show you their identification and, and check it against the list of people who were invited. That's what the real world, quote unquote, does. Right? That's called access control lists, ACLs. Uh, this is the model that, that sort of became mainstream since the 70s, and it has failed totally, completely, and abysmally, as we all know. Right? The fact that there, you know, that, that there are all these security problems you know, stems from the fact that it doesn't really work. Uh, the alternative, of course, is you can actually send out invitations and let in anybody holding an invitation. They actually have a token that gives them the permission to get to the party. Object capabilities are like are these tokens. It's the idea that you actually carry something with you. In particular, objects make nice capabilities. They're things that already can do all kinds of stuff. And so if you can get such an object that knows how to do something, say, right to the file system. Okay, rather than going off and checking at every access to the file, well, who are you? Let's see, are you allowed to do this? Well, maybe you are, but maybe someone called you isn't, so we'll crawl up the stack. And if you know the Java security model, you know how it isn't widely used because it's so expensive to use. What is used is the sandboxing that, that actually does work. Uh, so the idea here is instead of that, well, if you have an object that knows how to write to files, you can use it. If you don't have an object, there's no way you can write to file. You cannot go off and name class file somewhere, and then once you have this, give it a string, right? There's no. That's why it's uh, one of the reasons it's important not to have global namespaces, because that lets you grab just all kinds of random stuff. So you, it's hard to tell who's doing what, right? In this system, you have to be past something in order to 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 do something. So if you take uh, the, the the code I showed you, it does it imports two things from the world, the error class. And uh, what was the other one? The ordered collection class, right? In particular, you know for a fact it doesn't touch the file system. It doesn't get at the file system. It doesn't have a file object that it's asking for or getting from anywhere. And, it, and therefore, you know it cannot use it, right? So this is, this is, this is a difference, right? The you have an object. Either you have the file object or you have some other object that you know will give you a file, right? Through transitively, through some chain of calls. You can reach an object that can do this. That's what gives you authority to, to do things and, and, and potentially bad things that have to be controlled by security. And this actually requires you not to have static state. Right? Because otherwise, you know, these things are hanging about there and, and, and it's, it's just a hole that's begging to be used. So you can see that this fits very naturally here. We didn't really have to do anything special just by, by insisting that there's no global, you know, global namespace and these things have to be instantiated explicitly with arguments. Then we get this kind of, of effect. Uh, another thing you need, which isn't implemented yet, is access control. I mean, if your objects expose everything, well, basically the problem with Smalltalk is that uh, one of the problems is that all the messages are public. The only thing that you can use to, there are two things you can use to encapsulate stuff. Uh, blocks or instance variables. Now, we've just gone and made instance variables accessible via accessors, so we just blew that out of the water, right? So we're down to, to the, it seems we're down to the state JavaScript is in where the only encapsulation me mechanism is blocks, closures, right? That's not good, that's awkward to use. Uh, you should be able to declare methods public, private, etc. And have this enforced dynamically, not statically. It isn't like Java, public and private, right? It, it has to be a dynamic property. You're lo if a method is private, someone calls it from the outside, the lookup algorithm will not find it. 
Okay, that's where you, you, you enforce these securities. That unfortunately isn't implemented. It's probably a week or two of work on, on uh, you know, to put in the bytecodes. And if only we could find someone who had the time. We will. But it, it's not implemented right now. But really, to, to take security seriously, you will have to do that. Bear in mind, we're implemented on top of Squeak, so we're not taking, you know, the actual system has no security properties whatsoever. But the language design is there so you can. It doesn't undermine you. Uh, we just said all this. Let's talk about reflectivity, because that, that came up in the questions. And I'm supposed to end in 10 minutes, which is amusing. Uh, we'll throw rocks when, when you're tired. In 10 minutes, not now. Uh, so uh, there's a concept called mirrors. Again, this is one of those ideas that goes back to self. So basically, most lang object-oriented languages that do reflection in some form or another have all copied the small dot model. Uh, well, copied would be good. They have lobotomized the small dot model. Uh, with exception of common Lisp, which went and extended uh, the... Well, either way, you know, there's like uh, Goldilocks, you know the story? There's something has to be just right. Not too big, not too small. But anyway, uh, the problem with that is that now, like, what are the security properties of a small dot system? Well, I send you an object that is a capability. Now I ask that object for its class. Then I go modify the internals of this object. Or, and then as an extra bonus, I modify all the other objects of this class. Then I take ask the class for its superclass, and then I modify all the objects of the superclass. Really secure. Uh, there, there's a real problem here. So how do you maintain this flexibility? How do you keep this the power that we want while being secure? So the mirrors were, were developed uh, for, for other reasons, basically, in self, but they are really the object-oriented way of doing reflection. Uh, the idea is that the, this, this capability to do reflection is separate from the object. The object, by default, does not tell you interesting things that can let you modify it. It might tell you its class, but its class, a class in Newspeak is simply a factory. Right? It'll, it'll let you produce more instances. In fact, it doesn't really have to tell you that either. That can be overridden as well. But it certainly doesn't tell you how to modify it and reflect on it. That's a separate object. It's called a mirror. It reflects the other object. And once you have these mirrors, you can use them as capabilities for reflection. right? Because you can withhold them. Again, you, the, the program I showed you doesn't use reflection. It's a, it's, it cannot because it doesn't have... Well, it can because it's squeak and it can cheat. But in a proper Newspeak implementation, it will be as reflective as a Fortran program. Dead to the world. Okay, because you will have only if you see that it got its hands on mirrors from the platform object and you gave it a platform object that gave meaningful mirrors, would you be able to do anything interesting with it? And that's good for, it's good for security, it's good for deployment in, in say, if you have some embedded device where you can't really afford the extra footprint and you know you're not going to be reflecting on it. You can argue if that's a good idea, but you can't argue with, with, with small devices that have no memory. Uh, it's good for distribution. Uh, because, again, you can actually uh, talk to, uh, to a remote system uh, through these things. So there are all kinds of reasons to use mirrors. That's basically the story of how, how to reconcile reflection and security, and it all fits with this thing. And again, a uh, carefully chosen quote uh, that basically says the same thing. Uh, interop. So, um, briefly, right... This is small talk, right? These are primitives, right? So we don't like primitive stuff. We're trying to enlighten the world. And, and really the thing is, right, you go and, you, again, you put yourself in the position where you're explaining all this cool, wonderful small talk stuff to a non-small talker, and you browse the system. It's all message sends, it's all objects, blah, 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 blah. And then you accidentally click on one of these. And they ask what this is. And you smoothly go on. I'm glad you asked this question. Next question. <laughs> right? This is not, you know, one of the shining points of the system. Uh, yeah, everything's an object. So to which object are we sending this? You know. So uh, we don't have primitives. Uh, what you want is an object that's part of the implementation. The VM mirror, if you will. The, to which you can send messages and it knows how to do these magical things. Uh, it should be standardized. We have a sketch of this. We're, we're a long way from really doing this consistently throughout the system. 
because uh, we can cheat, because we can call squeak and stuff. But uh, basic idea is, again, what's nice about this is, again, this whole capability story carries through. Now, if I don't want somebody calling a primitive, I don't give them the VM mirror, I know that they cannot be using this primitive. Right? There is no syntax they could use. There is no mechanism they can get at it. Uh, another thing, foreign calls, right? Primitive and f primitives and foreign calls get intermixed, both in Smalltalk and in other systems, because by default, it's a path of least resistance, right? You implement your VM in C, you have a mechanism for calling C, then you say, ah, then if I want to call the VM for some primitive special purpose, I'll call that, right? That's what happened in Java with natives. In Smalltalk, it's kind of inverted, but essentially the primitives have evolved into, into FFIs, right? And they should be kept separate for all kinds of reasons because there are different, you know, there are different issues here. For example, the primitive knows it doesn't need things to be marshaled and converted. It knows all that stuff, right? It knows more about your objects than you do. It's the VM. Uh, and the assumption that it is in another language is also an inappropriate assumption. It doesn't have to be and so forth. So you should keep them separate. And uh, yeah, well, they suck. And instead there, are the, there is this notion of aliens. And uh, some of you might have heard this because there's been ports of this to, to squeak and so forth. Uh, Basically, if you want to talk to something outside the language, you talk to an alien object. It's an object that represents the, you know, some functionality of the outside world. Uh, this works. There's an FFI that someone here implemented. I can't quite remember his name. Um, and uh, anyway, it again has this nice property. If you don't give someone an alien, you know they're not doing any funny business calling because all of the security in the world is worthless once you call C. Right? So all this fits. Uh, what do we want to do now? Future work? Yeah, two minutes. That's that's a good time frame. Uh, we want to to get people to pay attention. At this point, the only thing to be done is to port it to the only platform that matters. Uh, and so we are working on a version that you know compiles to JavaScript, runs in the web browser. That whole UI that you saw, which we didn't talk about, which is written in Newspeak. Uh, would run in the web browser, which means mapping it to HTML, all kinds of things. Uh, we need to really get bootstrapped and disentangle ourselves from Squeak. Uh, initially, we'd be doing applications because there are certain parts of the system that are really hard to do in JavaScript, in particular the debugger. But uh, we have thoughts about how to do this. And, uh, you know, it's really the only way to beat Eclipse. Not that it's hard to beat them by being better, but the only way to overcome it is, you know, you fight a monster with a bigger monster. Uh, so, uh, other things, yeah, concurrency we haven't talked about because it doesn't really exist. We're still using the, the processes in Squeak and stuff, and that's a problem and a source of many of our, our bugs. We want to do actors. Actors are a natural fit with this again. Uh, basically, this idea that there is no global anything, right? It solves concurrency, it solves modularity, it solves security. Uh, Carl Hewitt knew this in 1973, and, uh, you know, He's going to be proven right in the next few years. Uh, let's see. There's a bunch of little features we don't have time to talk about. Um, big features, in, actually, as well. But uh, we're not going to go there. There's no time for that. It's open sourced under Apache 2.0. You can get uh, a drop from, uh, from this uh, address. Uh, I'd encourage anyone who, to play with it and to contribute and to get with a program you... You're going to need to break your habits because these issues are real. The security, the modularity, the interop with the rest of the world. And, uh, yeah, it all fits. It's all very simple because you're basically taking the same basic idea of an object that encapsulates something and just pushing it a little further. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Yes, again, my, uh, a quote that I found useful. Uh, we really, really have to get, you know, Smalltalk is so much better than the competition that you lose sight that it isn't perfect. But it, it is, uh, in particular, uh, in terms of adoption, you know how hard that is. You know that you've basically lost that war a long time ago. Uh, I'm not saying that I want to take over the world. No, I am saying that, but I'm not saying that I will. But I'm saying that you, if you intend to do that, if you have to have any hope, you do have to address these real problems that people are, care, care about, like modularity, security, and, and interoperability. Uh, so it's time to move forward. And uh, what else? Yeah, credit to some of the people who actually made this work and to 
various volunteers have contributed. Some of these people have contributed a lot. Some of them have contributed only small parts. So, Ryan, this guy, um, started working on Newspeak when he was in high school. He's now in, uh, started an undergraduate program. He's probably done more than anybody else here uh, on this list. Uh, it's, it's cool when you get a guy like that. He's really good. So I just wanted to call him out. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, the story. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for going 40 seconds over time. <laughs> Uh, sure, you're in charge of the time. These people have wanted to have a break, but make my day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'm a little bit concerned that, if, I mean, from outside, yeah. the object has to receive. We didn't explain the hardest part, right, because there's no time. Yeah, uh, so you're asking where do you start? Yeah, well, no, this is an important part, right? Because what we haven't said, we've, we've shown you how all these things are modular and they all, you know, don't... But you got to start somewhere. This is the... That was make it hard. But my question was more about encapsulation. Because uh -huh. if from outside you have to know what object you, you, you have to pass and not pass because you don't want... Because you want to keep security. Isn't that like breaking encapsulation? I mean, isn't that... But you need to know how the object is implemented. No, you, what you need you, what you need to know is what things it what authority it requires, right? And if you want to be secure, you have to you know when you know if uh, if you ask me for uh, some for my car keys, I might or might not give them to you, uh, but I might want to know all kinds of things, right? Yes, you 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 want to know exactly why and for what purpose, right? So for security. How this works realistically, presumably, if it's an application you trust, uh, you would invoke it with a command. We haven't shown how it all starts, right? And, and uh, that's actually key. But you'd invoke it with, a, with a, say, a, a, a command that will pass it a platform object that has a pretty wide you know, standard platform, like, like the Java platform. that will let you write to files or whatever, right? Ideally, it should control this at a finer grain. It depends how it's done. If it's something from the web, you'd invoke it with something that can't do very much, right? It's basically the initial, and this is something that you basically want to give, uh, say, uh, a, a fixed set of configurations that are at reasonable security levels and choose the command based on how you trust. And then the whole, the, how, how the whole thing works is that uh, basically uh, an application has a main method that takes a platform as an argument. And you load that application from disk or from the web or from wherever, you invoke that main method and not you, the, the system does it for you. You have to configure your applications in a, via a certain standard protocol, a lot like a C program has a main method. Right? I, could, I unfortunately don't have the time to, to step through all that, but that's actually very important is how do you, okay, so how do you start up somewhere you have to connect? And you do this essentially by building your application as an object that takes this platform and instantiate all the modules you need and tie them together and, and let them run. And the platform will come from, from whatever command that you, you start to invoke it. I know that's a little vague, but anyone who really wants to know, I can show you how, how that works. Mario? Uh, what, uh, yeah. Suppose example you show a whole other connection. Mm -hmm. In case I am uh, compiling uh, another method in the same class or in the same method, and now I use another class that I didn't define so I'm not sure I understand the config, but it's it's all going to be dynamic. So if if you um, are you asking if you overwrote it or if you're uh, in, uh, in, uh, my, my class, I refer to the class dictionary. Uh -huh. and I never wrote the initialized assignment to platform. Uh, okay, so so what will happen is uh, yeah, you'll get a does not understood. Understand? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just a, it's an undefined method. Okay, yeah, right, right. So actually, you do if you actually do get it uh, colored red, but we can't make it an error because it's it's perfectly legal to do that. It might be defined in a subclass or inherited or all kinds of things. But basically, if you don't define the slot, you'll get a method not understood. If you if you define a slot 
then you have a method, but it'll be nil, right? And you'll get, you know, eventually a method understood on what you try to send to it, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, and the second question, how do you really implement primitives? Because even if you don't have that ugly syndrome, yeah. you have to somehow... Okay, uh, so... so it, food, I mean, mm -hmm. you have to Right, so it depends on your implementation, right? Again, this isn't small talk, and it doesn't actually, it's implemented on squeak, and so how do we implement it? We call, well, eventually we have a squeak class called squeak VM mirror, and it, it has primitives inside it. You don't have to do that. In JavaScript, we won't do it that way, right? The main point is there is an abstraction that knows how to talk to the underlying implementation in some way, and implements the interface that you want. Thank you.